masters of vertical takeoff. It's an ability that fixed wing aircraft have always envied. What if you could get a plane to take off vertically? No runways, no limits, no rules. Harrier pops up into the sky and Harrier is providing intimate fire support and the fighter ground attack role for ground troops. Vertical takeoff, the fastest way to get airborne. Birds make it look easy, but 5,000 pounds of metal? Over the past 100 years, helicopters have perfected the art. It required billions of dollars, a whole lot of engineering, and some serious skill. In the 21st century, choppers can take off and land whenever, wherever. But the helicopter does have limitations. Firstly, it will never fly as fast as a fixed-wing plane. You cannot make a helicopter go as fast as a, a jet fighter because the technological limitations of the rotary wing make it impossible. The helicopter's forward velocity is determined by the speed of the turning rotor. When the helicopter reaches a certain speed, the air traveling over the rotors will be moving at the same speed as the retreating blade, which means that that blade is no longer producing lift and stalls. The world speed record for the helicopter was set in 1986 by a British Westland Lynx flying at 249 miles per hour. And because of retreating blade stall, this is unlikely to be broken. The second drawback for helicopters is their limited ceiling. At higher altitudes, thin air reduces engine performance and the ability of the rotor blades to grab air and fly. 18,000 feet is the maximum height at which a chopper can hover. A helicopter's rotor is a, is a screw, it's like a ship's propeller. And if there's no air for the screw to screw into, then you're not going to get your helicopter up off the ground. The helicopter's third limitation is range. Fixed-wing aircraft can cover thousands of miles. Helicopters, not even in the same ballpark. In a normal configuration, we have internal tanks that gives us about a 250 to 260 nautical mile range. And we can actually put the two external tanks on, one a 450 gallon and another one a 230 gallon. If I do that on both sides, I can extend my range to 1,100 miles. The problem is, is that when I bring that out, there's a lot of drag on the aircraft, so it degrades the performance. Altitude, speed, range. Fixed wing airplanes beat helicopters every single time. But there's one thing choppers can do that planes have always envied. They can take off without runways. Airfields are really difficult to defend and they tie the aircraft down to certain predictable patterns of operation. How much better would it be if we could get rid of those airfields and just pop up wherever you like, pop down wherever you like, and still deliver that air power? By the 1950s, air forces around the world had seen what choppers could do. Rapid deployment without runways would give them a huge strategic advantage. You gotta keep in mind, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, we were in the middle of the Cold War and rapid deployment fighter interceptor aircraft was on everybody's mind. In the first half of the 20th century, rotary flight was the only vertical takeoff option. Existing engines weren't powerful enough to launch a plane vertically into the air from standstill. Then came the breakthrough. In 1943, Frank Whittle tested his new jet engine in a prototype Meteor airframe. And with it came the potential for vertical flight. Move on 10 years, 1953. The British military began experimenting with ways of using jets to create vertical lift. The result? The extraordinary flying bedstead. Flying bedstead basically was a frame with an engine and a pilot on it and basically it produced enough lift to get it in the air and prove the concept that if you put enough thrust behind a brick you can get it airborne. Using the exhaust from the jet to produce lift and further exhaust nozzles pointing sideways to control the machine, the bedstead rose eight feet off the ground hovering for eight and a half minutes. The race was now on to produce an operational vertical takeoff fighter. In the first serious tests, engineers sat the planes on their tails, treating them more like rockets. Of course, the pilot's looking up and has no idea where the ground is or what's going on behind him, so uh, takeoffs are one thing, but landings are certainly another thing. Control was the main problem facing the designers. How to translate from vertical takeoff to horizontal flight, and then back again to the vertical mode for landing. 
but lessons had been learned with the flying bedstead. Using the exhaust system to create lift, Sir Sidney Cam, designer of the Hawker Hurricane, was able to create the world's first vertical takeoff fighter, the Harrier. If you want to do a vertical takeoff, you move the nozzle lever in the cockpit backwards and points the nozzles down at the ground. Then, if you open the throttle, the exhaust comes out here and lifts the aircraft up off the ground. When you got it off the ground and you then want to accelerate the aeroplane, you take the nozzle lever and you just push it slowly forward and you're swiveling the nozzles round until it's in conventional flight. The system was called Vector Thrust and used the exhaust to create lift and forward movement. It also solved the problem of controllability. Exhaust nozzles on the nose and wings enabled the pilot to maneuver his plane in any direction. Sir Sidney's design became known as the Harrier Jump Jet. On land, it didn't need a runway. At sea, the danger of takeoff was reduced. Only one question remained. How would it perform in combat? In the 1980s, the Harrier cut its teeth in the Falklands, protecting the British Navy's fleet as it tried to take back the islands from the Argentines. In Operation Desert Storm, the U.S. Marine Corps' Harriers became the most forward deployed strike fighter, launching every 23 minutes during the ground offensive. Freed from the shackles of runways, jump jet technology revolutionized fixed wing versatility. Harrier drops in a farmer's field, Harrier refuels, rearms, Harrier pops up into the sky, and Harrier is once again providing intimate fire support and the fighter ground attack role for ground troops. This new technology also gave the Harrier a tactical edge in aerial engagements. With vectored thrust, you can put these nozzles down at 600 knots, and it's almost like going into a brick wall. It's, the airplane slows down very, very quickly. If one had a, an enemy behind, if you came into the hover stop, we would slow down quicker than any other airplane. So he would probably have shoot, and you can get a shot. Vertical takeoff used to mean helicopters. With the advent of the Harrier, it meant planes as well. Now, in the 21st century, the fusion between the two has taken another twist, and a new vertical takeoff contender is born, the CV-22 Osprey. Using tilt rotor technology, it combines the speed, range, and fuel efficiency of a turboprop aircraft with the vertical takeoff landing and hover capabilities of helicopters. With a massive development budget and a whole lot of interest from the military, it looks like the CV-22 is set to be a prime mover on the digital battlefield. Drawn together, the branches on its family tree reflect its unique genesis. A 2,000-year-old Chinese toy inspired the first rotary pioneers. A Spaniard, an Argentine, and a Russian mastered vertical takeoff. Improved engines turned helicopters into lethal weapons. And jump jet technology allowed planes to take off without a runway. The result? A fusion of rotary and fixed wing flight, the CV-22 Osprey. Weaponologically, it's one hell of a bird. 接下来，面对全球不断成长的人口，诺贝尔奖得主能源科学家丹凯门揭露一项能够提供交通运输电力的最新科技——生态之城，就在绿地球。接着播出。